there have been many, many questions written down, but we can't answer all of them. <coughs> in answering these questions, or rather, inquiring into these questions, we are both involved in it, not just the speaker answering the questions, but both you and the speaker are sharing in the question. So don't just please merely listen to what the speaker is saying, but rather joining with the speaker in answering the question. What is true creativity? And how is it different from that which is celebrated in popular culture? What is true creativity? <coughs> and how is it different from that which is celebrated in popular culture? What is generally called creativity is mostly man-made. Painting, music, literature, both romantic and factual, all the architecture, the marvelous technology, And all those who are involved in all this, the painters, the writers, the poets, the philosophical writers, probably consider themselves as creative. And we all seem to agree with them. That's the popular idea of what is a created person. We agree to that. I think we all see that. That all man-made things most beautiful, the great cathedrals, temples and <coughs> Islamic mosques, are extraordinary, some of them are extraordinarily beautiful. I don't know if you have seen them. And if you have, they are really ex marvelous. And <coughs> the people who built these were anonymous. They, we don't know who built them. With the, they are only concerned with building, writing, the Bible, all that. Nobody knows who wrote them. But now, with us, anonymity is almost gone. And perhaps with anonymity there is a different kind of cre creativity. It's not based on success, money, and uh, 28 million books sold in 10 years, and so on and so on. The speaker himself, at one time, tried an omnibus. Because the speaker doesn't like all this fuss and nonsense. He tried to talk behind a curtain.
and it became rather absurd. <laughs> so anonymity has great importance. You, in that, there is a different quality, different. Uh, this personal motive doesn't exist. The personal attitudes and personal opinions, it is a feeling of freedom from which you are acting. But most creativity, as we call it, is man made. That is, this creation, this creation takes from the known. Right? The known. The great musicians, Beethoven, Bach, and so on. It is from the known, the act. And the writers, philosophers, and so on also have, have read, accumulated develop their own style and so on, always moving or acting or writing from that which has been accumulated known. And this we call generally creativity. Now is that, is that really creative? Please, let's talk about it. Or is there a different kind of creativity which is born out of the freedom from the known? Yes, Because when we paint, write, create a marvelous structure of the stone. It is the accumulated knowledge, whether in the scientific field or in the world of art, human art, there is always this sense of carrying from the past to the present, or sudden or imagination, romantic, factual, modern, and so on. Is there, is their creativity something totally different from this activity that we call generally creative? We're asking, I think it's rather an important question to go into, if you are willing, whether the, there is an action, there is a living, there is a movement, which is not from the known. That is there a creation. From a mind that is not burdened, from all the turmoils of life, from all the social pressures, economic and so on, is there a creation out of the out of a mind that is freed itself from the known. And it can then use memory. You understand? Knowledge. But we start with knowledge, and that we call creative. But we are suggesting that there is a creativity which is not born out of the known. When that creative 
impulse or movement takes place, it can then use the know, but not the other way around. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. You, if you don't mind some time, try or be in a find out whether the mind can ever be free from the known. The known being all the accumulated experience, remembrance, the knowledge that one has acquired, the impressions and so on, to, but I can, the mind can be free from all that. And in that very state of mind, creation as we know it may not be necessary. You understand? A man who has a talent for writing feels he must express himself. He develops his own style. The way he writes, Keats, Eliot, and so on, and the others, they have this impulse to write, fulfill, create. Perhaps their own lives are rather not all that beautiful. Michelangelo, Raffaello, and all those people. Some would call these names. <laughs> I'm not learned, but I visited many museums when I was young. I was pushed into it all that. <laughs> <laughs> and the remnants of all that remains. And I have talked to great many artists writers, friends, and so on. It seems to me, it seems to me that all our creation in the scientific world, in all human art, it is always from a point, from a talent, from a gift, and that gift is exploited to its fullest extent, like a musician who has a gift, a prodigy. He, you know, becomes tremendously important. And we, common people, admire all that and wish we had some of that. As we haven't got it, we run after them. You look know, almost worship them. The conductors, the you know, the gate that goes on. And when you begin to question what is creativity, as the questioner is asking, is it something totally different, which I think we all can have. Not the specialists, not the professionals, not the talented, gifted. I think we can all have this extraordinary mind that's really free from all the birth that man has imposed upon himself, created for himself. And then out of that same rational, healthy life, something totally different comes. And that may be not necessarily be expressed as a, in painting, architecture. What should you follow? You, if you are gone into this fairly deeply, 
and I hope you will, you will find out that there is a state of mind which actually has no experience whatsoever. Because experience implies a mind that is still groping, asking, seeking, and therefore struggling in darkness and wanting to go beyond it. But a mind that is very clear, not confused, has no conflict, has no problem, has no problem, you can. Such a mind, it's no need to express talk or I'm talking, sorry. <laughs> the speaker is talking not because he wants to impress you or anything of that kind, which is too silly, or persuade you to pertinent attitudes and opinions and judgments. It's a kind of friendly communication with two people who are concerned with all this enormous, complex life, who haven't found an, a complete, total answer to all this. And there is a complete and total answer if we apply our minds, our hearts to this. So there is a creativity which is not man-made. Don't please say that's God-made, that has no meaning either. Because if, if our own minds are extraordinarily clear, without a shadow of conflict, then out of that mind is really in a state of creation which needs no expression, no fulfillment or all that publicity and nonsense. <coughs> you have said that in the very seeing there is action. Is this action the same as the expression of action? If not, is there a connection between the two? And how do they possibly relate to suppression? You have said that in the very seeing there is action. You understand? Is this action the same as the expression of action? If not, is there a connection between the two? And how do they possibly relate to suppression? You have said that in the very seeing there is action. Is this action the same as the expression of action? If not, is there a connection between the two? And how do they possibly relate to suppression? What the speaker said was, if I remember, if we remember rightly, that in observation, in a, the very observation is action. I am, there is an observation of greed, observation, which is to observe without any distortion without motive, without saying, I must go beyond it and all that, just to 
absorb this greed movement. And that very observation sees the whole movement, not just one particular form of greed, but the whole movement of God. And that movement, that perception, that seeing, that observation ends the movement. That's what he calls action. There is no interval, this I must re- forgive me if I'm going to a little bit more. There is no interval in seeing and acting. One must be careful here. It is not impulsive acting. It is not saying, I feel like it and I act. That is what we are all doing. But what we are saying is that in observing greed, I am taking that as an example, in observing greed, hatred, violence, whatever it is, if that observation, when that observation is completely non-directed, right, then there is no interval between the see and the act. Whereas we have intervals, see, concluding, abstracting an idea, and then carrying out that idea, which is the interval between uh, the creation of an idea and the acting of that idea. I don't know if you follow this. If you observe yourself, this is what goes on. This time interval is the, is the in which there is all kinds of other problems arise. Whereas the seeing is the very movement of ending greed. Now, the questioner says, is this action the same as the expression of action? Have you understood? It? Is this the same as the expression of action? That is, you see a cobra, a snake, there is instant expression of self-preservation, self-protection, which is natural, healthy and so on, unless you are some kind of peculiar person, you then you play with these things. (laughs) But the self-possessive instinct is immediate to run away or do something about it. There the action has given, the seeing has expressed itself in action, physical action. Right? We are talking of not only physical observation, but also the observation with the whole of your mind, not partial observation, which we do, but to be so attentive that is the whole of the mind, if you can do this. I don't know if you have tried all these things. That is to, to give complete attention, okay. that means attention implies there is no centre from which you are attending. I don't know if you follow this. Hmm? Must I go into all the all right. When you concentrate, it is from a centre, from a point to point. 
They don't know if you understand. Therefore, it's limited, restricted, narrow. Whereas attention is not, it has no centre. You are ten. I don't know if you follow me. If you now, forgive me, may I find you out, if you're really attending now, you will see you're not attending from a point. Yeah? So find out for yourself your belief. I'm not persuading you anything of the kind. It's not group therapy and all that business. If you're willing, just observe, just see if you can completely attain. That is what you are. You hear, you see, you feel everything in your mind is alive or ten. Then you will find out that there is no point from which you are attending, from a point to point. It is in that attention there is no border. Whereas concentration has a border. If not, is there a connection between the two? And how do they possibly relate to suppression? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Is there a connection between the two? That is the physical action, you see, when you see a danger, you move it immediately. And the action, the perception, the observation, which ends a particular reaction, as called greed, ending totally, not partially. The questioner says, asks, is there a connection between these two? And how do they possibly relate to suppression? They don't, there is no suppression. I don't know. Look, all right, let's take greed as we did the day before yesterday. Greed, we all know how it arises, what is responses, and so on. In observing greed, if there is a division between the observer and the observed, that is, I, there is greed and I say I am greedy, which means I am separate from that thing called greed. Right? You are following? Well, so, this separation, in this separation, there is either conflict, suppression, uh, overcoming it, and so on, all the travail that's, and, that comes about in this division. But this division, Actually, does it exist if you go into it? The, what is gre greed is me, is the observer. Right? I wonder if you understand. May go on. Greed is not separate from the person who says, who is observing as though you are different from the observer. We are saying the observer is the observed, which doesn't mean I, I observe the tree and the tree. I would end up in an asylum. <laughs> but we are saying when there is this reaction, which is named as greed, that greed is not different from the me who is observed. So you eliminate altogether the division. There, in that, there is no sep suppression. You follow? You, you are that. 
if you come to that point, you understand, when you say, yes, I am that, not as an idea but as an actuality, then there is a totally different movement takes place. I don't know if you have tried it. After these weeks of talking, you must have tried one of these things. <laughs> if you have, you must have found out, tested. That is, the total absence of conflict, which is an extraordinary thing because you have broken the pattern of this division which creates conflict. For the making of images to aim, must thought also aim? Is one necessarily implied in the other? Is the end of making image making merely a foundation upon which one can begin to discover what love and truth are? Or is that ending the very essence of truth and love? For the making of images to end, must thought also end? Is one necessarily implied in the other? Is the end of image making merely a foundation upon which we can begin to discover what love is and truth are? What love and truth are? Or is that ending the very essence of truth and love? We have talked about it the other day, how images are made. We will go into it again because we live by images. Not only actual image cre created by the hand, but, but the images created by the mind. By thought. These images are continuously added and taken, diminished. This is the movement that we go through. I don't know if you are watching your own images you have. You have your own image about yourself. If you are a writer, you have an image. If you are a poet, you If you are a wife, husband, and all the rest of you, each one has a created for himself an image about himself. This begins from childhood, through comparison, through suggestion, by saying you must be as good as the other chap, or you must not do, or you must. So gradually this Accumulated process begins. And in our relationships, personal and otherwise, there is always this image man, man, woman, all the rest of it. And as long as this image exists, you are either wounded, bruised, Heard, or this image prevents act, having actual relation to the other. We this is we we'll explain and draw gone into this. Now Krishna says, can this ever end, or is it? something with which we have to live our last in life. And in the very ending of the image, does thought end? And he asks also, are they interrelated? 
image and form. And when the image making machinery comes to an end, is that the very essence of love and truth? That more or less what he means. Have you ever actually entered an image? Voluntarily, easily, without any compulsion, without any motive, without anything, I must take my image, it must be, I won't be hurt, and all the rest of it. Just voluntarily, pleasantly, easily, happily, and then the image you have. The image of God, the image of Christ, you know all that. Various Christ. Take one image and go into it. In the explore, in going into it, you discover the whole movement of making images. You will start to see. That is, if one has an image, let's say a belief, which is an image, go into it. That image you begin to discover in the very ending of it, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's a sense of isolation. And so you see the image making involves all this. And if you are fighting, you carry on. See, I'm, uh, much better keep something I know rather than something I don't know. Right? Whereas if you go into it fairly seriously and deeply, what, who is the maker of this image? Not one particular image, but the image making machine. The whole of it. Is it thought? Is it the natural response, natural reaction to protect oneself? Wait, wait, don't agree yet, don't agree. Natural reaction to protect. Protect physically right? and protect psychologically. One can understand the natural response of protecting physically. How? To have food, to have shelter. To have clothes, not to be run over by buses, and so on, not to jump down a precipice. That's a natural, healthy, intelligent response. In that, there is no image. I don't know if you follow. It is, when you see a precipice, you move over. It is not the image that's moving away. It is the physical danger you see, and the physical danger of, and the self-protective reaction makes you move. In that there is no image. I don't know if you see. But psychologically, inwardly, we have created this image, and this image is the outcome of a series of incidents, uh, accidents, hurts, irritations, you know, which is after all the state of a mind which is inattentive. I don't know if you follow me. The, may I go on? You follow me? Does it interest you? Don't agree with me, do it, please. 
I don't care if you flatter me, if you agree with me. It's nothing to me. I say, you don't. Unless you want to do it, don't do it. If you want to do it, do it. This psychological image making, is it the movement of thought? Yes. We know it's not thought doesn't perhaps very, very infinitely thought enters in self protective react physically. But the psychological image making must be the outcome of constant inattention, which is the very essence of hope. You understand what he said, said just now? Thought in itself is inattentive. Please, I carefully explained previously that attention has no center. It has no a point from which to go to another point, which is a concentration. When there is complete attention, there is no movement of form. It's only the state of mind that's inattentive. And thought then the thought which is always partial and therefore not complete attentive creates the image. Have you followed a little bit? That's your. I'm, I'm in, inattentive. I'm thinking I'm doing something else or, you know, inattentive. My wife or friend or somebody tells me you're, you are, you are silly. And immediately I formed an image. Or somebody said, what marvelous person you are. I formed an image. Which is the state of inattention, lacking attention, creates the image by thought, which in itself is inattentive. Got it? I've discovered something new. <laughs> right? Because thought, please look at it carefully for yourself, thought, which is matter, Thought, which is outcome of memory, outcome of memory, outcome of experience, knowledge, and that must always be limited, partial. Memory, knowledge can never be complete. Right? Can never be complete. Therefore, it's partial. Therefore, it is inattentive. Thought is inattentive in itself. I wonder if you see. So, when there is attention, there is no image made. You get it? There is, it's not a conflict. You see the fact. When you, when you insult me or flatter me, I am completely attentive. It doesn't mean a thing. But the moment I am not at paying attention, I, my thought takes over, which is inattentive in itself, and creates you. Got it? Now, the questioner says, is the ending of image making the beginning, the essence, the love and truth? Not quite. But, sorry. Not quite. <laughs> so to understand these two questions, this qu what the love is, what truth is, we must go into very, very deep. It may not be the time or the occasion. I was going to talk about the speaker. I was going to talk about Saturday and Sunday. It doesn't matter.
we're going to now break the engagement part. Is love, is desire love? Is pleasure love? What do you say? I know all our life, most of our life, is directed towards pleasure in different forms of pleasure. And in, the, in that movement of pleasure, sex, etc., etc., takes place, and that we call love. Right? Am I saying something not true? So we are asking, is love, desire, pleasure? And can there be love when there is conflict? When the mind is crippled with problems? Problems of heaven, problems of meditation problems of between man and woman problems of you follow when the mind is not is living in problems which most of minds are can they be loved and can there is great deal of suffering, physical, mm, as well as psychological, can there be love? So I am not answering this question, because we can find out. And is truth a matter of conclusion? matter of opinion of philosophers, of theologians, of those who believe so deeply about dogma, rituals, hmm? you know, which are all man-made. That can such a mind know what truth is? Or truth can only be when the mind has is totally free of all this jumble. See, so philosophers and others never look at their own lives and go off into some metaphysical, psychological world which they begin to publish and become famous. So truth is something, sir, that demands extraordinary clarity of mind that has no problem whatsoever, physical or psychological, a mind that has not known even conflict. You understand what I'm saying? The memory of conflict must fail. You know? The following, because we have great many pleasant and unpleasant memories, remembrances that are delightful, remembrances of this people, 
with that mind, with that burden, we are trying to find truth. It's something. You understand? It's impossible. So, a mind that is astonishingly free from all man-made psychology, from all men, then truth can only come into can it, Truth is something that can, that is, when there is love and compassion. Cannot have love and compassion when there is any of the violence. When you are clinging to some attachment, when attachment becomes all important. So, sirs and ladies of me, I'm not being personal. This is not worse to me. I, if it was not something actual, I wouldn't speak. You understand? I wouldn't be dishonest to myself. If it is not a fact, I would be such a terrible hypocrite. I wouldn't ever sit up anywhere on a platform or talk to anyone. You understand what I'm saying? This requires tremendous integrity. Would you please make a definitive statement? <laughs> about the non existence of reincarnation since increasing scientific evidence in quotes is now being accumulated to prove reincarnation as a fact. I am concerned because I see large number of people beginning to use this evidence to further strengthen the belief, a belief system they already have which enables them to escape facing the problems of living and dying. Isn't it your responsibility to be clear, <laughs> direct and unequivocal on this matter instead of hedging around the issue? <laughs> Would you please make a definitive statement about non existence of reincarnation since? Increasing scientific evidence code is now being accumulated to prove reincarnation as a fact. I am concerned because I see a large number of people beginning to use this evidence as a further strengthening uh, of a belief system they already have, which enables them to escape from facing the problem of living and dying. Isn't it your responsibility to clear, direct, and equivocal on the matter, on this matter, instead of hedging around the issue? <laughs> we will be very definite. <laughs> so this idea of reincarnation has existed long before Christianity. Right? The Hindus, the ancient Hindus, talked about it. I must tell you a lovely story about this one. And it is prevalent and almost actual in India and probably in the Asiatic world. They believe in reincarnation. 
Now, what is it that incarnates himself? Not only now, incarnating now, but reincarnating. You follow me? That's one point. Second, this idea of reincarnation being proved scientifically as an evidence, so that people can escape through that, the question implies. And the question also says, I'm concerned because people are escaping. Right? Are you really concerned people are escaping? <laughs> they escape through football. Hmm? They escape through going to the you know, what do you call the basketball? Yes. And may I also add, escape going to church? And the form of entertainment. <laughs> And let's put our that aside, being concerned what other people do. Because I'm concerned, we are concerned with, with the fact, with the truth of reincarnation, right? And you want a definite answer from the speaker. What is it that incarnates? to incarnate, to be born, right? <coughs> what is it at the moment now, living now, sitting there, what is it that is living? You understand? Reincarnation means in a future life, right? I am asking, what is it that is taking place now, which is incarnation. You understand what my question Right? What is it? Go on, say it. Say it. As we are sitting here, nothing is happening. Very simple. You are listening to some talk or some idiocy or some rubbish or you like what you are hearing or you don't like what you are hearing. But in our daily life, when you go away from here, what is it that is actually taking place? Which is the very movement of incarnation. You follow? Incarnation. What is it? You know it. I know. Your struggles, your appetites, your griefs, your envies, your attachments. Hmm? Your, your for all that. Is that what is going to reincarnate next life? You understand what I'm saying? Go on, Sattvita. Hmm? Now, those who believe in reincarnation, that is to be born, with all the things which I have now, all the things which we have, to be born next life, modified, perhaps, and carry on life after life. That's the idea. If you really believe in reincarnation, really, it's a, something that is alive, belief. Belief is never alive, but suppose it's tremendously alive. Then, how you are now, matters much more than what will you, you will be next. You understand what I'm saying? Are you following? That is, sir, uh, it's called in the Asian word karma, I think we call that, which is, which means action. Not all the stuff and more, action. If I live a, con a life now, in this period, 
with all my misery, confusion, anger, jealousy, hatred, violence, I'll, it may be modified, but it'll go on next life. Right? This is obvious. If you go into all that. So there is evidence of that. The evidence of violence. Evidence of remembrance of things past. You follow all this? It may be remembrance of things past, of a past life. Right? That remembrance that uh, accumulated me, this accumulation is the me, the I, the ego, the personality. That bundle modified, chastened, polished a little bit, <laughs> goes on to the next life. Right? This has evidence. Right? You're following all this? So, the question is not whether there is reincarnation. Follow? I'm very clear on this matter, please. I'm very different. Not that there is reincarnation, but what is far more important than reincarnation is the ending of this mess, this conflict, this now. You follow me? Then you are, there's something totally different goes on. I want to get on this. <coughs> It's like my being unhappy, miserable, sorrowing, and I say, I hope next life I'll be better. Right? That hope of next life is the postponement of facing the fact now. It <coughs> uh, the speaker has talked a great deal to all those believers and so on who have lecture, written, talked about reincarnation, endless. <coughs> it's part of their game. And I said, all right, sir, you believe in all that. Right. What about your, if you believe, what, what you do now matters. Right? Right, sir? <laughs> But they're not interested in that. They are interested in the future. You follow what? They don't say, look, I believe, but I will alter my life so completely there's no future. You follow the point? Don't ask me at the end of the answering this particular question, you're evading it. I'm not. I see the, the present life is all important. If you understand going into that present life with all the turmoil of it, the complexity of it, and you end it, you follow? End it, not carry on with it. Then you have a you enter into a totally different world. To do, to end it, you must apply yourself. You follow someone? Give attention, you must go out. Not just say, well, I believe in it, reincarnation, I hope in the future something will take place. I think this is clear, isn't it? I'm not hating. You might ask me, do I believe in reincarnation? Right? That's the question in fact, too. I don't believe in anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a wish. I have no belief. Which doesn't mean I'm an atheist, I'm ungodly and all that nonsense. To have no belief. 
going to Chelsea, what it means. It means that the mind is freed from all entanglements of belief. Oh, that. Oh, is it not? There is. You've heard of the Upanishads in India, the Upanishad the literature of ancient India. There is a story there about death, which is incarnation of death. The son of Brahma, you know what Brahma is. The father is sacrificed, giving up. He has accumulated so much, and it's one of the ancient customs and rules was that after him, collecting again the five years, he must give up with it and begin again. Would you do all that? <laughs> So he had a son, and the son says to him, you are giving all this away to various people and so on. Whom are you going to give me away? To whom are you sending? Father said, go, they are not. And, you know. So the boy comes back several times, and the father gets angry and says, I'm going to send you to death. Being a Brahmana, he must keep his word. So he sends him to death. And on his way to death, the boy goes to various teachers and says, Some say there is uh, incarnation, others say there is not. So he goes home, so he comes to the house of death. When he arrives, death is absent. <laughs> That's a marvelous story to go into. <laughs> death is absent. He waits for three days. On the third, on the fourth day, death appears and apologizes. <laughs> he apologizes because the boy was a Brahmin. And he says, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And in my regret, I offer three whatever you wish. You can be the greatest king, greatest wealth, and you can have immortal in all. He promises him. And the boy says, I have been to all these teachers, and they all say different things. What do you say about death and what happens after? So death says, I wish I had pupils like you. You understand? Mm -hmm. Who's not concerned about anything about that, except that? So he begins to talk, tell him about truth, about a state of life in which there is no time and so on. So that's the story. Thank you. If you are the world and one feeds it, sees it, what does it mean to step out of the stream? Who steps out of it? The writer, and the questioner probably has read some books of the speaker. <laughs> if you are the world, if, if you are the world, in quotes, in quotes, and one feels it, sees it, what does it mean to step out of the stream? Step out of the stream in quotes. Who steps out? What time is it, sir? Twenty minutes of one second. <laughs> <laughs> sir, this is a very important question because this will be the last question. My I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long. <coughs> in spite of the tape.
I wonder if one realizes, not as an idea, not as something romantically appealing, but as an actual fact that we are the world, psychologically, not physically, in color and hair and all that stuff, but psychologically, inwardly, we are the world. Go to India, they have the same problems as here. Suffering, loneliness, <coughs> death, anxiety, sorrow, right? as we have it in the West. Wherever you go, this is the common fact of humanity. Fact of all human beings. So, psychologically, inwardly, we are the world. Right? Is that an idea or a fact? Yes. When you hear this statement, do you make, a, make of it into an idea or actually realize? As you, as you realize a, when a pin is put into your thigh or in your arm, you are the actual pain of it. Not the pain of the realizing, the pain when an injection is made, that's an actuality. You have no idea about it. It is so, there's pain. Now, the, do we actually realize this immense fact. Or is it just a lot of words, say, I see it and I know it and I feel it, hmm? but something biting, something that is so tremendously active. Then the psychological fact of that affects the mind. You understand? The mind is not your mind. Your brain is not your American little family brain. <laughs> it is the human brain. And when one realizes that, it brings a sense of great, you know, of not only responsibility, responsibility implies generally guilt in it. If you are irresponsible, you strike the guilt about it. I am using the word responsibility without any sense of guilt. And this sense of tremendous human responsibility for all things connected with human beings, how you educate your children, how you behave, how you fall. If when you actually realize this immensity, it is immense, then the, the particular entity as me seems so insignificant, you understand? All my little worries, my, you know, become so shoddy. And when you are, when you see this fact, when you, in your heart, in your mind, you feel this, you cover the earth, you understand? Both cover the earth. Nature, ecology, and all of that stuff. You follow? You want to protect everything you can. Because you are responsible for it. And when you feel, when there is this, the question is asked what does it mean to step out of this stream? And who does step out? The stream is 
this constant human struggle, misery, right? Of all human beings, the communist, socialist, imperialist, in Chinese, from technicians, it is the common ground on which we all stand. And to be free of that is to, you follow? To be, to be free of all that is not who steps up. The mind is, it has become something totally different. You understand? Am I making this point clear? It's not I step out of it. The mind is no longer in it. So if you, if you are attached and you end attachment, something totally different takes place. Not you are free from attachment. You understand? So there is a different quality, a different tone to your whole life when one realizes this enormous fact that we are humanity. Thanks, I think that's enough, isn't it?